Part of the state of California, in and for the county of San Diego, the people of the state of California, crime of conspiracy to commit murder. These are Seth Welch and Tatiana Fusari, who are facing charges for murder in Michigan. On August 2nd, 2018, Marianne Welch, the 10-month-old daughter of the couple, lost her life due to extreme neglect by her parents, Seth Welch and Tatiana Fusari. Child Protective Services had been involved with the family since 2014 when traces of THC were found in the system of their eldest newborn child. At the time of her death, Mary weighed a mere eight pounds. It's unfathomable how a tiny baby could be neglected to such an extent. The worst part? Seth and Tatiana knew their daughter was severely underweight, but refused to seek medical help. They cited religious reasons and a lack of trust in the medical system. It's truly heartbreaking. She had a breathing problem. She coughed one time to clear some birth fluid out of her lungs. What? And they kept us under observation for 72 hours. He issued two separate pieces. Um, flavors and forms of paperwork. One that had a bunch of notes on it saying all sorts of bad health care things we were doing wrong. When the investigation began, the sheriff discovered an unhygienic home filled with vermin, insects, and mold. Prosecutors also showed photos of the couple's home in disarray, full of bags of trash, even holding up the moldy mattress she was found on. They say she had been left unattended for more than 19 hours. Her crib mattress was torn. It was soaked through with urine to the point it pooled in a baby tub underneath her crib. That mattress was moldy. It was so moldy that there was mold on the wood part of the crib. It was a nightmare. The autopsy revealed that Mary suffered from chronic malnutrition, indicating that food and water were intentionally withheld. The couple faced homicide felony murder charges in August 2018. In June 2020, Seth Welch was convicted of first-degree murder and received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Harsh, but some may argue it's well-deserved. In Solon Township, that you're both charged with what they call felony murder, while in the perpetration or attempted perpetration of in the first degree, they're alleging that you murdered one Mary Welch. That is a charge called homicide felony murder, it is life without parole. They're talking about this Mary Welch. It is a felony, possible penalty of up to life imprisonment or any term of years less than life. In a shocking turn of events in 2021, Tatiana testified that Seth had been abusive, subjecting her to and She claimed that she wasn't allowed to take Mary to a doctor. I always, always, always hoped that things would get better. He pulled over to face me and he started me in the face. And then I tried to roll over onto my right side to face the wall so he would just, just leave the front side of me alone, but he put his weight on me. While she acknowledged the abuse, she also stated that she didn't notice her daughter's declining health or know the cause of her death. It's a complicated situation to say the least. In November 2021, Tatiana Fusari was also sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for first degree murder. Additionally, she received a 15 to 30 year sentence for first degree <laughs> However evil you think this couple is, it wasn't the only time that a parent had killed their child. There was the case of Lori Vallow Daybell. This is Lori Vallow Daybell. A juror who voted to convict Lori Daybell of murdering her children is slamming the killer mom. Who is facing charges for murder in Idaho. Lori Vallow Daybell and her husband, Chad Daybell, are in court for the murder of Lori's two children, seven-year-old J.J. Vallow and 16-year-old Tylee Ryan. Y'all know that I love you. I, I want you home. They're also suspected in the death of Chad's first wife, Tammy Daybell. 
Before all the madness unfolded, Lori was happily married to businessman Charles Vallow. They seemed like the perfect couple, raising Lori's daughter Tylee from a previous marriage and even adopting JJ, who was Charles' sister's grandson. JJ had autism, and Lori was described as a patient and ideal mother for him. All good so far, right? Well, somewhere around 2017, things started to change. Lori's friends noticed she was diving headfirst into the world of doomsday literature. This Chad guy, who had quite the imagination, wrote fictional books about prepping for the end of the world. Lori and Chad hit it off and even started doing religious podcasts together. Living on the Edge of Heaven, where I tell more about my two near-death experiences and how that prompted me to write my novels. And now, here's where it gets downright eerie. Lori's friends revealed that she started talking about zombies. No, not the brain-eating kind you see in movies, but people whose souls were supposedly taken over by She even referred to her own husband, Charles, as a demon. That's when Charles decided enough was enough and filed for divorce, fearing for his and the children's safety. Tragedy struck when Charles went to Lori's home to drop off JJ, but he ended up being shot dead by Lori's brother, Alex Cox. Lori and Tylee claimed they heard the shooting and insisted it was self-defense. Things started spiraling even further as Lori moved closer to Chad, settling in Rexburg, Idaho. Alex, the trigger-happy brother, conveniently moved into the same apartment complex. There was a, I got in a fight with my brother-in-law and I shot him in self-defense. And is he hurt or is he alive or? Yeah, there's blood. He's, he's not moving. You know, no weapons? No weapons on me. All right, come on out this way. I'm gonna have you have a seat right here on the curb. Inside is Lori Vallow's fourth husband, Charles, dead on the living room floor. What happened today? How did it get to this? And then your niece pulls out a bat? Well, it wasn't her. He was getting close and she came out to defend my sister. Her bat. Your niece? Yes. Okay. And then she poked at him and then he took it away. I turned around and he hit me in the back of the head with the bat. So I went to my room and got my gun. That so was you went to your room, meaning yeah, the room you're room staying, staying in? Yeah. Okay, and you brought your a brought a gun yeah. with you? Yeah. Do you always yeah. bring a gun? I can still carry all the Okay, so are, are you? Okay, just stand over there for just a second, guys. And then the unimaginable happened. Both JJ and Tylee vanished into thin air. Say, please, please step up. These are beautiful young children. As the investigation unfolded, it became clear that something sinister was afoot. Suspicion fell on Chad's property when human remains were discovered in shallow graves. It was a heartbreaking discovery as they identified the remains of JJ and Tylee. Things were found on the property of her husband. Lori and Chad were slapped with first degree murder charges for the deaths of JJ and Tylee. Chad faced an additional charge for Tammy's murder. A jury dropped the hammer and found Lori Vallow Daybell guilty of all charges. Is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tamara Tammy Daybell? Answer, guilty. As for Chad, he pleaded not guilty to everything. Lori Vallow Daybell, AKA the Doomsday Mom, or as some prefer, the Cult Mom, was sentenced to life without parole. She showed no reaction as she was led away. Lori's story was complicated, and her crimes were horrible. However, there are parents whose actions would shock you even more, like the case of Timothy Jones. This is Timothy Jones Jr., who is facing charges for murder in South Carolina. Timothy Jones Jr., a father from South Carolina, has been convicted of murder by a jury in the deaths of his five young children. During the trial, it was revealed that Jones confessed to exercising his six-year-old son, Natan, until he died. after an electrical outlet was broken in their home in August 2014. Afterward, Jones considered his options for several hours, even leaving the other children at home with Natan's body while he went out with his oldest child. Ultimately, he made the decision to kill all of his children. Jones strangled his eight-year-old daughter, Mira, and his seven-year-old son, Elias, with his hands. He used a belt to choke his two-year-old son, Gabriel, and his one-year-old daughter, Abigail, because his hands were too big. Jones then wrapped the bodies of all five children in plastic and drove around the southeastern United States for nine days, making erratic trips and engaging in various activities. 
During this time, Jones researched countries that don't extradite suspects to the U.S., took his passport, and searched for ways to disintegrate bodies faster. He also played his oldest daughter's favorite song, Butterfly Kisses, according to his confessions and phone records. Jones eventually dumped the bodies in garbage bags on a hillside near Camden, Alabama. He was arrested after being stopped at a traffic checkpoint in Smith County, Mississippi, where an officer detected the smell of decomposition from his vehicle. Uh, it was three two patrol cars, a black Escalade. As I was walking up to the black uh, Escalade, I noticed a, a foul odor, and uh, I asked, what is that smell? And they said it was coming out of the vehicle. It was a smell of decomposition. It's a smell that you don't forget. The defense argued that Jones' diseased and damaged brain prevented him from understanding right from wrong when he committed the murders, claiming insanity. They pointed out that the children were not malnourished and did not show signs of regular abuse, suggesting that Jones' mental state and difficult life circumstances contributed to his actions. The defense didn't fly. As to indictment 189, Elias, guilty. 190, Abigail, guilty. 191, Gabriel, guilty. 195, Natan, guilty, and it is so signed by the fourth person this fourth day of June 2019. And handed the death penalty. However bad you think Timothy Jones' case was, it can't be compared to the notorious case of Michelle Blair. The struggle with them all the time, they were never there. This is Michelle Blair, who was facing charges for multiple murders in Michigan. In a shocking and horrifying case that gripped the nation, Michelle Blair, a mother of four from Detroit, Michigan, murdered two of her own children and kept their bodies in a freezer for nearly three years. The gruesome discovery was made on March 24, 2015, when Blair was evicted from her apartment due to unpaid rent. During the eviction process, court officials stumbled upon a deep freezer in Blair's living room containing the remains of her two children. Stephen Barry and Stoney Blair. The police were immediately notified and it was determined that the children had been dead for at least three years. The medical examiner ruled their deaths as homicides. Michelle Blair was arrested and brought to trial where she confessed to the murders of Stephen and Stoney. Um, to my understanding, to get a trial is to get to the truth, right? I'm already saying that I did it. I'm freely giving myself and accepting life in prison. My son is worth that to me. So what I don't understand is, from what I heard today, why the prosecutors are dragging their feet. If I'm already giving myself to you like, hey, I did this, what's the problem? You get what I'm saying? I'm not gonna come back like, oh, I didn't understand my rights, I'm not a coward. She claimed that she killed her children because they were sex <laughs> her youngest son, Matthew. However, these allegations were never substantiated. Blair's confession revealed a disturbing sequence of events. In August 2012, she claimed she discovered her son Matthew simulating activity with dolls and learned that he had been abused by his older brother, Stephen. Enraged, Blair physically assaulted Stephen, pouring scalding hot water on his genitals, making him drink Windex and subjecting him to choking. Stephen eventually died from the abuse. Nine months later, Blair discovered that her daughter Stoney was also s Matthew. As a result, she starved and brutally beat Stoney until she died in May 2013. Instead of turning herself into the police, Blair decided to conceal Stoney's body by placing it in a plastic bag and storing it alongside Stephen's body in the freezer. During the trial, Blair displayed no remorse for her actions and insisted that she did what she believed was right. In June 2015, she pleaded guilty to two counts of first-degree premeditated murder and received a life sentence. She is currently serving her sentence at the Huron Valley Correctional Facility in Ypsilanti, Michigan. You take responsibility of it. You're therefore sentenced to the Michigan Department of Corrections for the rest of your life without the possibility of parole, meaning, of course, that you will never get out. For many people, Michelle Blair got what she deserved. However, this wasn't the only time a convict got a sentence that felt like justice. There was the case of Justin Harris. This is Justin Ross Harris, who is facing charges for murder in Georgia. Now we're starting to wonder, did Harris intend to kill Cooper? 
when we return. Justin, the father of a toddler who died after being left in a hot car for several hours, faced multiple charges in the tragic incident. The 22-month-old child, Cooper Harris, was left in the car for over eight hours in Atlanta, Georgia. That's my patrol car. That's the vehicle I was driving that day. Uh, the blue lights, in fact, are the blue lights that I turned on when I first uh, began driving up uh, Cobb Parkway. The father was supposed to drop the child off at daycare, but forgot and went to work instead. Finished the work day and then I was driving on Acres Mill. I caught a glimpse of him when I, when I looked to my right to change the lanes. I caught a glimpse of him in the back and I thought I'd saw it. I thought I was seeing things. When the father left work and began driving home, he discovered the child unresponsive in the back seat. Despite attempts by witnesses to resuscitate the child, it was too late. The temperatures that day exceeded 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and the interior of a hot car can reach temperatures as high as 130 to 140 degrees within a few hours, and the child was left in the car for around seven hours. There were evidence to show uh, that he was in a vehicle that was maybe 90 degrees or 95 degrees, but less than 100. C could a person survive in that temperature in a vehicle? Yes. Um, looking at the totality of these circumstances, if, if Cooper Harris hypothetically was left in his vehicle at 9 o'clock in the morning and law enforcement were called sometime after 4 o'clock, is it possible he was alive around lunchtime? Uh, if the temperature at lunch was only in the 90s, low 90s, yes. Prosecutors believed that the father, Justin Ross Harris, intentionally left his son in the car to die. And what he said during the interview seemed to suggest that. Monica, show me emergency. There's a baby on the ground. June 18th, 2014, Vinings, Georgia. People at a shopping center watch in horror as a man pulls out a toddler's body from an SUV. We don't know if the baby is breathing. It doesn't look like it. Do you see anybody around them? Yeah, his dad, and it was like somebody was going to give him CPR. During the investigation, scandalous details about Harris's secret life emerged. Prosecutors revealed evidence of extramarital affairs, incriminating text messages, and sexual communications with other women, including a then 16-year-old girl. One of the most damaging pieces of evidence was a message sent by Harris himself, just moments before locking his son in the car, expressing a desire for an escape. Investigators also found that Harris had used online messaging apps to communicate with multiple women, engaging in explicit conversations and exchanging nude photos. And who Harris had been sexting during his marriage. How old were y'all when you met? I was 18. How old was he? His 30s. Did he have a wife? Yes. Did he have a kid? Yes. But he loved you and y'all were best friends? Yes. All oh, being sex. Um, did he seem nervous or anything? Not at all. We didn't talk about like everyday things and it did get sexual sometimes. Okay. And were pictures sent back and forth? Okay. And these are different parts of your body, private parts. He discovered that he searched online for topics such as how to survive in prison and age of consent in Georgia. He had even watched a video demonstrating the deadly temperatures inside a hot car. Furthermore, prosecutors alleged that Harris had visited prostitutes in the weeks leading up to his son's death. Surveillance footage from Harris's workplace showed him approaching his car during lunchtime without glancing into Cooper's back seat, further raising suspicions. The defense attempted to exclude the scandalous online messages from the trial, arguing that they were irrelevant to the charges of murder. However, most of their attempts were unsuccessful and the evidence was allowed. He was found guilty on eight felony counts, including malice murder, cruelty to children, and criminal attempts to commit felony. Harris was eventually sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. If you thought these reactions were shocking, you'd be amazed at this video of parents who exploded on their kids' murderers in court.